ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dunal Hernan. I, I got a clap from Stephen Fry. I'm, this has made my year. Welcome everyone to the Hamming Innovation Hall at Nokia Bell Labs. It's great to have you here in person. And hello to everyone that's streaming in from remote sites all over Bell Labs globally. And to all you weird people in the future that will watch this in the post recording. Well, I don't know what to say to you, but hello as well, I suppose. So it's great to have you here. I have two basic uh, jobs to do. It's very simple for me, thankfully. One is a very mundane thing around housekeeping and the other is um, I need you as an audience here to help me achieve one of my goals for this year. So the housekeeping thing is that the restrooms are at the front of the building, fire exits are at the front left and right of the building and here just off the stage, uh, left and right. And then to help me achieve my goal, um, I have a goal that I need to be part of one of these lectures where there isn't a single instance of a cell phone causing an interruption. And I've tried everything. I've uh, tried naming and shaming. I've threatened physical abuse the last lecture. I even said that anyone's phone that goes off, it's direct proof that they are stupid and lacking intellect. And that didn't work, <laughs> honestly. So uh, I'm going to speak to your better uh, part of your uh, mentality and ask you to take all, out your phones for just 10 seconds, turn it to silent, turn it to vibrate, turn it to flight mode, or just turn the bloody thing off, please. And trust me, you'll turn it off for an hour, it'll be great, you'll have a great time, and the world will still be spinning on its axis when we uh, come back an hour later. So with that, talking about spinning on one's axis, I'm going to introduce Marcus Weldon as the Chief Technology Officer of Nokia and the President of Bell Labs. So, so Dunal tried to first, the, uh, to get you to turn off your phones, the first uh, for me is I'm going to say nothing. <laughs> no, it's not possible. <laughs> but I am going to say relatively little because uh, there's nothing I can do to compare uh, anything to, to Stephen Fry. Uh, he's more humorous than the average bear. Yeah, he's, he's a better actor than the average bear. He's a better thinker than the average bear. He's a better writer than the average bear. Uh, in fact, he might be the best of all those things across all bears. <laughs> I might go one step further, across all of Bell Labs. Uh, so that's really uh, who we have here with us today. We, have, we spent a, a day with him, had dinner with him last night. It's been just a fabulous time. He is everything you would want him to be, uh, and possibly more. And it's very rare that we get to say that. So it is a true honor and privilege to have uh, Lord... Steve, no, no, I didn't. He's not Lord yet. But... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Stephen Fry, I welcome to the stage, and I think you're just going to be wowed. So thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you so much. I do think it would have been nice if Marcus had mentioned my modesty as well. Um, <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm so thrilled to be here. I've had a marvellous morning being shown around just some of the uh, extraordinary um, moonshots and, uh, and, uh, and blue sky and uh, remarkable thinking that is going on here. And I, I just can't tell you how. I feel like basically the closest I can come to is I'm Charlie and, uh, and Marcus is Willy Wonka. <laughs> and I suppose that makes you Oompa Loompas and you're very <laughs> fine Oompa Loompas too. Um, now... Um, I'm not going to wear my glasses, actually. I seem to be um, okay without them, thank goodness. Let, let me open, at least, by saying that um, uh, despite a, a lifetime immersing myself uh, in what I consider the provoking, beguiling, bewitching, and often befuddling joy of technological development, um, information, um, and uh, shiny things, uh, I am no computer scientist, no coder, uh, no programmer. Many of you, um, most of you, if not all of you, who have been kind enough to come along today, uh, will know much more about um, the technicalities of the subject I'm going to discourse upon. Um, take this, if you take it at all, as the offering of a curious mind. Uh, curious in both senses of the word, avid for information, and just plain odd. <laughs> now, the future um, has never been bigger business uh, every day more stories appear 
relating to the great confluence, the great convergence, the time that is surely coming uh, when the swelling currents of the streams and tributaries of robotics, bionics, AR, VR, gene editing, nanotechnology, brain machine interfaces, the internet of things, and machine learning break their banks and flow together into one mighty technological flood, a tidal wave which will sweep over the human and natural world and perhaps bring about the singularity, the end of the primacy of humankind, or possibly the end of our existence as biological entities and the beginning of a new transhuman or non-human dominant sapient species upon the earth. The same questions are asked. Uh, what will it do to our minds, our social groupings? Is this the end of the workplace of education, medicine, commerce, and social love? leisure and labor as, as we've always understood them uh, since the dawn of language. The hinges of Pandora's box are beginning to squeak as the lid rises. Plenty of concerns make the headlines today, trolling, post-truth, fake news, the rise of big data and its ownership of citizenry's every move, preference, spending pattern and propensity. The slavery of the gig economy, the echo chamber and filter bubble that tribalizes and ghettoizes us further and further, the threat of hacking, identity theft, extortion and cyber terrorism, the grooming and recruitment of the young for nefarious ends bullying, body shaming, and so on, and on, and on, and on. But these, it should be understood, are what Donald Rumsfeld would call the known knowns and the known unknowns. They are all issues that worry us now and of which we are fully cognizant, albeit powerless, uh, it seems, or unwilling to undress, to address. Uh, even politicians, cultural commentators, and business people are aware of these issues. But such challenges are as nothing when set beside what's coming down the pike in a very short while indeed. But before I make a total fool of myself by making any rash statements about the future, let me tell two stories from the distant past. They're both well known, but bare repetition. Uh, after all, as I think it was Schlegel who said, uh, a historian is a prophet looking backwards. I already hinted uh, one of the stories I'm going to tell you when I reference the hinges of Pandora's box. In reality, I should have said Pandora's jar. As a matter of fact, we often call it Pandora's box because no less a figure than one of the heroes of early humanism, Erasmus, mistranslated it from Hesiod. Anyway, Pandora and her jar uh, were all part of Zeus's uh, revenge on the Titan Prometheus uh, and on us. The king of the gods had not forgiven Prometheus for stealing fire from heaven and giving it to mankind. He looked down and saw fires breaking out everywhere. Uh, industry, ceramics, cooking, foundries for art and war. But he saw that man had the divine spark too, the inner creative fire that makes us seek, push, invent, question. Perhaps we can call that the consciousness that we sense is uniquely ours in the animal kingdom. Zeus was to punish Prometheus by chaining him to the Caucasus and sending an eagle to peck out his, his liver every day. But mankind he punished in a more subtle subtle way. And for once I used the word mankind without fear of being tutted. There were no human women at this point. Uh, the god Hephaestus, Vulcan to the Romans, was commanded by Zeus to create the first human female from clay moistened by his spittle. Hephaestus took his wife Aphrodite, um, his mother Hera, his daughter, his aunt Demeter, and his sister Athena as models and lovingly sculpted a girl of quite marvelous beauty into whom Aphrodite, Venus to the Romans, of course, the goddess of love and beauty, then breathed life. The other gods joined together to equip her uniquely for the world. Athena trained, trained her in crafts, science, and arts. Hera endowed her with authority, poise, and self-possession. Apollo taught her skill in music, learning, archery, rhetoric, and reason. Hermes schooled her in the deception and, and curiosity and cunning arts, and he gave her a name. Since each of the gods had conferred upon her a notable talent or accomplishment, she was to be called the All-Gifted, which in Greek is Pandora. Zeus bestowed one more gift upon this paragon. It was a jar or box filled with, well, he didn't tell her. And down she went to earth, where she was wooed and won by Prometheus's brother, Epimetheus. Well, you know what happened. After weeks of aching curiosity, Pandora waited until she was alone in the house, and she couldn't help herself, which of us could. She pulled the jar from its hiding place and twisted the lid. 
waxen seal gave way and she pulled it free. There was a fast fluttering, a furious flapping of wings and a wild wheeling and whirling in her ears. She cried out in pain and fright and jumped back as a host of horrifying, leathery, scaly forms flew out of the mouth of the jar, a great cloud of them chattering, screaming, and howling in her ears. With a cry, Pandora summoned up the courage and strength to close the lid and seal the jar back up. But it was too late. Like a cloud of locusts, the shrieking, wailing creatures flew away over the town, over the countryside, and around the world, settling like a pestilence wherever humankind had habitation. And the names of these creatures were hardship, starvation, pain, anarchy, lies, quarrels, disputes, wars, battles, manslaughters and murders, death and disease. All these pains and sorrows were released into the golden age and illness, violence, deceit, misery, cruelty, lies and anarchy filled our world and they would never leave. What Pandora did not know was that when she shut the lid of the jar, so hastily, she forever imprisoned inside one last little creature, which was left behind to beat its desperate wings in the box forever. Its name was Elpis, Hope. When I first found out about and joined the internet back in the late 1980s, I watched it grow with fascination and excitement. By the time the World Wide Web arrived, I was anxious for my friends to get themselves websites and email addresses. After all, it was fairly pointless being the only person I knew with an email account. <laughs> I'd, I'd been through this before as an early adopter, as a matter of fact, when for three years I was the only person I knew with a fax machine. <laughs> it was like being the only person alive with a tennis racket. Pretty <laughs> useless. Anyway, I told my friends that this, this thing, this internet, was the greatest gathering of human beings in the history of the planet. As new services came online and Web 2.0 blossomed into the social media services we now know and perhaps rely on, I believed, I really believed, that humankind might well be saved, enhanced, perfected by this all-gifted creation. It would spread art, literature, music, culture, philosophy, enlightenment, and knowledge. In its train would come new freedoms, a new understanding between the peoples of the world, a new contract. This was to be our millennium's Pandora, an all-gifted organism that would spread learning, understanding, amity, comity, and peace. I looked at budding projects like Wikipedia, and I saw Voltaire, Diderot, and Thomas Paine's Enlightenment project becoming a reality. I saw art galleries and archives becoming freely available to all. I saw special interest groups able to exchange information and ideas with their fellows across the globe. Whether it was coin collecting, a love of a particular style of music, a shared pleasure in gaming, hiking, or cosplay, a rare physical or mental disorder in common, suddenly people could contact each other across the world. Free translations, free lectures, tours, user-generated advice on travel, hunting for the best deals and bargains, sharing experience in all fields of human endeavor. Borders, barriers, frontiers, and boundaries would melt and dissolve. An end to tribalism, racism, ignorance, fear, a new dawn for mankind. It was Pandora, all gifted, all good. Twitter, for example, I, I joined Twitter early on, thinking it a fun, trivial little nonsense that might be worth pursuing, but when it showed how people could connect in real time as they massed in the squares of Tunisia and Egypt, ushering in the Arab Spring, my joy was complete. What tyrant could endure in this new world? How could censorship and propaganda survive when the wisdom and knowledge of crowds was there to shine the light of truth in all the world's darkest places. The new Pandora's suite of accomplishments and capabilities would bring about a paradise on earth, utopia made real. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> You're right to laugh at my foolishness, I do myself. When did the lid loosen on the jar? When did I become aware that perhaps it wasn't quite so perfect after all? The odd caterpillar in the salad shouldn't put us off green vegetables, and the occasional fly in the ointment shouldn't put us off applying it. But the beating of the leathery, scaly wings of something worse fluttering from the jar couldn't be ignored, even by so perfectly gullible and cosmically optimistic a fool as me. 
The lid had been lifted, and evil things flew out. Bullies, monstrously cruel and malicious thieves, extortionists, brigands, pirates, liars, con artists, predators, monsters and trolls. Spite, enmity, meanness of spirit, cruelty of intent, and greed. So much obscene, naked, panting, shuddering greed. Hope was nowhere to be seen. So have I gone from dewy-eyed, dopey, and idiot optimist to dead-eyed, despondent, and despairing pessimist? Well, my second story, from long ago, <laughs> concerns a great ruler in the East who called together his ministers and greatest sages. I have won the world, he told them. I have all the power and pleasure that anyone can require, but I am not at peace. My mind and fighting spirit are racing but I have no enemies to defeat. I want some occupation, some pastime, some puzzle that will fulfill my passion for war, strategy, conquest, tactics, and absorb my time. Whosoever invents, designs, confects, or concocts such a system, such a pastime, will be granted any wish. Well, the cleverest and most cunning talents in the empire the designers, creators, poets, planners, inventors, dreamers, and visionaries worked furiously to come up with some creation, some invention, which could satisfy, satisfy the emperor's ennui and ensure their own future wealth and happiness. And the day came for the emperor to judge their entries. He circled the great hall of his palace, examining each of the offerings submitted for his inspection. Gold, silver, and brass forts and castles of immense mechanical sophistication promised hours of realistic war game play, enough to satisfy any bored imperial warrior, surely. He passed by each stand like a celebrity chef judging a cookery competition or a duchess at a flower show, sniffing and tweaking and prodding and testing. Nothing tickled him or worked his saliva glands until he finally came to a table at which sat an old Persian man who favoured him with a wrinkled, snaggletoothed grin and bade him sit before him and play the game he had invented. It looked very plain, next to the great artifices and apparatuses that, could, that were created by the others. A wooden board, two ranks of light boxwood figures facing across to two ranks of identical dark ebony figures. My game is unique, the inventor said in his strange... Farsi accent, because there is no luck, just planning, cunning, skill, daring, and imagination. Just like war and just like life, here is the king in my country of Iran, we call him the Shah. I shall be the black pieces, you must attack my Shah. When he has nowhere to move, you may cry, Shahmat, the king is dead. Checkmate, said the emperor, who was a little deaf. Um, Close enough, said the inventor. <laughs> He showed the emperor how each chess man was allowed to move, and they played, and the pair of them played and played and played. The emperor had never seen a game like it. Such complexity from such simplicity, such traps, surprises, artful creations and combinations. The other submissions to his imperial majesty's competition stood no chance. This new game of shachmat was declared the winner. You may ask for any reward, cried the delighted emperor. My wants are simple. My family small, the inventor replied, sweeping the few remaining pieces from their last game and showing the empty board. You see my chessboard here, just eight squares by eight. I would ask only that a single grain of rice be placed for me on the first square, and then two on the next, and four on the one next to that, then eight, then 16, and so on, until you have come to the last square, adding twice as many grains each time. Ha! cried the emperor, clapping his hands. For all your cunning, you missed a chance to enrich yourself, old man. You are too easily satisfied. Bring a bag of rice. Within moments, the emperor's grand vizier was pinching out a single grain from a sack and placing it with haughty disdain onto the first square, A1 in modern chess parlance, or Queen's Rook 1. Two grains he placed on B1, four on C1, eight on D1, 32... 64, and finally 128 grains on H1, the end of the first rank, King's Rook 1. The Grand Vizier was getting a bit bored with such a fiddly undertaking and sent for a pair of tweezers. 
128 was rather fiddly, and for A2 on the next rank, you would have to count out twice 128 to fill that square with uh, 256 grains, which was already too much for the small space to contain. Uttering a weary oath at the nuisance of it, he chose instead to place a small stone on the square and heap the grains onto a floor tile. B2 next to it needed 512 grains. The emperor saw that this was going to be a boring procedure and waved a hand and was making to move off when his chief astronomer and mathematician, the most wise and learned sage of the kingdom, stood before him. Sire, he hissed in uh, agitation, I have made calculations. When the vizier gets to the halfway point, the end of the fourth row, it will require two billion grains of rice just to fill that 30-second square. By the time he is on the second square of the seventh row, over half a trillion grains. By the end of that row, it will be more rice than the world has ever seen. By the last row, more rice than the world could ever see. More than there are stars in the sky. More than there are grains of sand in the desert, mighty one. If you grant his wish, you will bankrupt the empire and the world will be a parched desert. The king tried to do the sums in his head then looked at the figures the sage had chalked on his slate and thought hard. He slowly saw how vast the numbers became. By this time, the sage had calculated the weight of so much rice. No horses, yaks, or dromedaries could carry so much. Not in a hundred thousand times a hundred thousand years. The vexed ruler did now what any powerful leader would do, what you and I would probably do in the same circumstances. He swung his scimitar and sliced off the inventor's head. <laughs> as a lesson to all clever people not to get cute with kings. <laughs> and, so, and so chess was born, and so too the terror and horror of the remorseless playing out of exponential growth was introduced to humanity. The grains on the rice board story has been repeated and refined to demonstrate the havoc such alarming rates of growth can wreak and how tiny manageable integers can quickly explode into numbers so vast that our earthbound sublunary imaginations cannot hope to deal with them. So much in life seems to be exponential. We are the result of exponential division. One cell becomes two, four, eight, then 16, and so on, until an amoeba-like blob can somehow coalesce into the form of a jellyfish, a grizzly bear, an orchid, or Angela Merkel. <laughs> <laughs> exponential progression means that as humans, we go from one cell to the 27 trillion that complete us in just 46 steps. That's all. But if we look backwards, we can see the effect too. We have two parents, four grandparents, eight great-grandparents, and so on. It doesn't take many generations before the number of my direct ancestors, i.e. individuals who are all quite as necessary for my existence as my parents, exceeds the number of humans that has ever existed. A few steps further back and the number exceeds the quantity of mammals and then all eukaryotes and all life and all the grains and atoms that make up the planet. The exponential curves prove that everything in the universe is our ancestor, that we are, as Sagan famously said, star stuff. They prove, too, that the smallest elemental building blocks can transform themselves into living structures of mind-boggling complexity by no more than small recursive iterations of procedures as simple as binary fission, mitosis and meiosis, and all the other things I've forgotten from school biology. And through the power of that progression, the day would come when an exponential curve would topple the game of chess, just as it caused the loss of its inventor's head. But first things first, from its arrival in our world, the depths and subtleties of the game of chess astonished us. Never mind the quantity of grains of a square, that, that on a square there are more possible games of chess, it turns out, than there are atoms in the observable universe. 10 to the power of 120 games, as opposed to the universe is feeble, 10 to the power of 80 atoms. This estimation is known, as it happens, as a Shannon number, uh, after Claude Shannon himself uh, and his work on these startling numbers, these game tree complexities, as they're known in the field. For chess was long considered the apogee of human intellectual achievement. 
Chess masters can keep every game they have played in their memories, not to mention the thousands of games played by past geniuses and contemporary rivals. They think forward many moves to levels of analysis that boggle the imaginations of amateurs. The more you get as a patzer, an amateur, a glimmering sense of what good chess play involves, the more staggered you are by the incredible mental powers of champions. When Boris Spassky was preparing for his famous world championship match against Bobby Fischer in 1972, he would tune up his reflexes by playing 10 master strength players simultaneously blindfolded. Easy to see, therefore, why chess became a symbol of the highest achievements of our remarkable brain, combining insight, forward planning, calculation, imagination, intuition, flair, memory, concentration, spatial awareness, resilience, determination, and in its highest flights, creative genius. Mastery of chess meant a complete intelligence, a mathematical intelligence, a strategic intelligence, a tactical intelligence, a visual intelligence, an artistic intelligence. Chess, therefore, became, from the very beginning, the holy grail as far as the creation of an artificial intelligence was concerned. Indeed, a candidate for the world's very first robot was the Mechanical Turk, an 18th century chess playing automaton that turned out to be a Wizard of Oz fake, a very small person tucked in a cabinet operating levers. <laughs> But two great geniuses who met here, well, perhaps not exactly here, but at the Bell Labs in 1942, Alan Turing and Claude Shannon were both interested in the idea of a machine being able to compute chess moves. This idea lodged in academia, technical institutes, and the popular culture. Think Professor Stephen Falcon in the 1993 blockbuster War Games. If mankind could build a machine that was capable of matching or even beating the world's greatest player, well, that would be the breakthrough. It would bring us closer to artificial general intelligence, the move from a box of cunning algorithms to the creations of sapient machines, machines with sense, if not necessarily a full sense of themselves. This would inevitably lead to machine superintelligence, which in itself would bring about that singularity, the moment when everything changes for us, as critical and momentous as the catastrophe of the Permian extinction when 90% of all life disappeared from the planet, or that first uh, atomic test in New Mexico in 1945, a day as important to our species as the longed-for first contact with an extraterrestrial species, or perhaps even matching the epoch-defining day when someone had the astonishing idea of sandwiching a toasted marshmallow between chocolate-smeared graham wheat crackers <laughs> and asking for s'more. Such seismic, game-changing breakthroughs come rarely in our history. What brought Alan Turing and Claude Shannon, two of the greatest intellects of their age, or any age, together in the 1940s? Not chess, of course, but war, and the need for the Allies to pool knowledge on developments like cryptanalysis, radar, and the cavity magnetron. Turing, of course, was specifically working on decryptions of German Enigma traffic. Shannon was fast becoming one of the world's greatest authorities on cryptography and artillery fire control systems. More excitingly, and less known to anyone but themselves at the time, the pair of them were independently working out the terms and protocols for what would become known as information theory. But it would probably be fair to say that Alessandro Volta brought them together. He heaped up, you'll remember, disks of metal, zinc and copper, in brine or sulfuric acid and gave the world its first reliable and consistent electrical pile or battery, named in his honour a voltaic pile. His work caught the eye of Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte, who in 1801 instituted a prize in his name, the Volta Prize for Research into Electricity, very far-sighting. The far sighted of, of Bonaparte. That prize was won in 1880 by my hero for this afternoon, apart from Shannon, who is Alexander Graham Bell, inventor of the telephone, or winner of the patent at least. Bell felt, <laughs> Bell felt he had personally made enough money from his great invention and plowed all the prize money into the establishment of research and development laboratories that bear his name to this day. Bell had ludicrous ambitions, as you probably know. He even went so far as to state, I hope you do not think me immodest when I say that I believe that one day there will be a telephone in every town in America. 
<laughs> the remit of these newly instituted Bell Labs was to feed the fruits of their labor into the parent Bell telephone company, Mar Bell, now to be divided in two. Manufacturing the physical equipment, the actual phones, cables, relay switches, and so forth, was Western Electric, who over the decades would become Lucent and Alcatel, and, and then finish up, and I use the word finish correctly, um, <laughs> into Nokia. Uh, the second company, which would uh, run the infrastructure and customer end, was the American Telephone and Telegraph Company, better known as AT&T, and no one knows what happened to them. <laughs> Bell Labs had been founded in a golden age of invention and mechanical engineering, but by the 1940s, when Shannon and Turing met, higher and deeper realms of science and numbers were replacing the down and dirty swarf, sweat and swill of invention and engineering. The mechanical world seemed to have given up most of its secrets. Materials and compounds were more crucial than ever, uh, but deep expertise in chemistry and a proper understanding of the nuclear and even quantum nature of matter was rapidly to become essential. Bell and his phone, Jacquard and his loom, Volta making his pile, Marconi and the radio, Samuel Morse and the telegraph, George Stevenson and the locomotive, Carl Bentz and the combustion engine, Lee de Forest and the vacuum tube, Thomas Edison, Nikola Tesla, these brilliant and extraordinary inventors, innovators, engineers and discoverers would have understood barely a single word or idea that passed between Turing and Shannon when those two sat together and chatted numbers and their relation to logic, probability, and so-called universal computation. These two individuals were probably the only on the planet who had taken so far the bold idea that information, words, and the flow of data could be expressed and mathematically modeled in Bayesian and Boolean terms, and that these mathematical expressions could be used as the basis for directing a flow of current such that the current's journey through diversion, resistance, capacitance, rectification, and amplification might allow the storage and manipulation of data and the performance of calculations. Such fancy rhetorical, theoretical frameworks were all very well, but existing technology could never realize the extraordinary information revolution that these ideas hinted at. Delicate, breakable glass vacuum tubes were unreliable enough when put to dedicated tasks like code breaking and gunnery calculation. The fantastic possibilities raised by Shannon and Turing, well, these surely could never be made real in the lifetime of the century. The inefficiency, the overheating of the tubes, such problems appeared insuperable. The history of Bell Labs and its achievements is well covered in literature and libraries and online, and I'm sure you know it better than I do, but their refinement of vacuum tube technology from 1,000 hours of reliable use to 80,000 hours allowed them to create the transcontinental system that realized Bell's mad ambition to get a phone to every town in America and some. The brilliant but tragic William Shockley's work on the manipulation of current in solid state materials like copper sulfate and silicon came up with the Nobel Prize winning semiconductor triode or transistor. Shockley left New Jersey to establish a business in his hometown, his hometown of Palo Alto, California, and Silicon Valley was born. Eight of his senior collaborators left him as his behavior, politics, and management style became ever more bizarre. Two of that traitorous eight, Gordon Moore and Robert Noyce, would set up their Integrated Electronics Company, or Intel, um, which built on that early semiconductor work, finding ever more cunning ways of layering silicon in wafer-thin P and N state sandwiches that they called integrated circuits in which the world welcomed as microchips. In 1965, Gordon Moore first propounded his celebrated remorseless and astonishing law. You're all familiar with his declaration that technological advances in chip production would proceed such that the density of integrated circuits would double periodically, somewhere between every 18 months and two years. Twice as many transistors in the same space is the way this is exponential curve is most commonly described. The power and speed of computing doubling every 20 months, perhaps better expressed as the cost of computing consistently halving every 20 months. It's worth mentioning that Moore stated this not as a law, but as a mixture of prophecy, proposition, and goal, one which so far has been met with pretty astonishing accuracy. 
How do we picture Moore's law in action? If in the year that Moore first declared it, you had a car that could go at five miles per hour, but which doubled its speed at the same rate as Moore's law, it would now be going at 671 million miles per hour. Mars in five minutes. Actually, that's not quite true because I came across this analogy in a book published in 2015. So in fact, by now, the car has reached 1.3 billion miles per hour. In other words, it's now Mars and back in five minutes. And that speed will double next year. Here's another way of looking at it, one that shows how fast the numbers accelerate out of control, how the slope becomes a wall. The referee places a drop of water in the middle of the pitch in a stadium, like the MetLife here in New Jersey or Wembley in London, and then a minute later, he places two drops. Then a minute later, four drops. To fill up the stadium would take just 49 minutes. But, as Callum Chase observes in his book, The Economic Singularity, the startling fact is that after 45 minutes, remember, it's 49 minutes, it's fill. After 45 minutes, the stadium is only 7% full. If you're top and back looking down, you might see something happening, a puddle forming far below. Four minutes later, you've drowned. Whoosh, the curve becomes a wall. Here's yet another way of looking at it, an example closer to Gordon Moore's world. In 1996, the US government's American Strategic Computing Initiative started building the ASCII Red supercomputer. By 1997, it had achieved its goal of being the first to achieve true teraflop status, that's to say performing a trillion floating point operations per second. For three years, it was the most powerful computer on Earth, bar none. Just five years after that, the same level of processing power was available to any teenager with a Sony PlayStation 3 in their bedroom. And that was 11 years ago, and nothing has stood still since then. The law has continued to press. Technology is not a noun, it is a verb. My view of the power of the exponential curve and therefore Moore's law is that, as Niels Bohr once said of quantum mechanics, if you aren't shocked by it, then you haven't understood it. <laughs> it doesn't just apply to silicon chips, of course. Light-emitting diodes, LEDs, are subject to an equivalent of Moore's law called Hates' law. Every year, the cost per lumen falls by a factor of 10, and the amount of light generated per LED package is increased by a factor of 20. The amount of data being mined is exponentially doubling too. And in 1996, irony of ironies, what do you think was swept away by the power of that ineluctable growth but chess? That year, deep blue, IBM's dedicated chess machine defeated Garry Kasparov, probably the greatest player ever to push a pawn. If back in the 1950s or 60s you had told one of the fathers of artificial intelligence or of the information age that the day would come when a human-constructed intelligence would beat the world's best chess player, they might have suggested that this moment would mark some kind of real powerful and potentially terrifying watershed because chess, as I have said, was always considered the apogee, the acme, the summit of human intelligence. Yet the Deep Blue victory did not elicit the reaction that might have been expected because Deep Blue cheated. Yeah, its team may not have behaved quite fairly during the tournament, but I mean that Deep Blue cheated in a much more meaningful way. Rather than utilizing an intelligence, Deep Blue's team at IBM realized that by the mid-90s, integrated circuits had become powerful enough to write a program that could analyze 200 million chess positions in a second could throw itself ferociously into every move and counter move and look deep into scenarios that could offer it the best candidate move in every position. It was remorseless and frightening. Kasparov and others described the experience as feeling that an unstoppable wall, a great grim granite wall was approaching them. They were engulfed by the power of the program. Screw creativity, imagination, insight, understanding, and intelligence. This was brute force calculation, as mindless but effectively destructive as a cyclone or a swarm of locusts. The victory was not artificial intelligence, or indeed intelligence of any kind, just the result of Moore's law. Deep Blue was a single task calculating machine that proved nothing other, unfortunately, than that chess wasn't, in the end, so difficult a nut to crack. It wasn't so much a triumph for AI as a loss for chess's exceptionalism. 
Larry Tesler of Xerox, Xerox Park, had a rueful but insightful rule named after him. The moment a machine can do it, it's no longer artificial intelligence. The moment Deep Blue defeated Kasparov, chess stopped being a realm for AI. As Noam Chomsky remarked, a computer winning chess is no more surprising than a forklift truck winning a weightlifting competition. <laughs> As Moore's law rolls on, the humiliation was ground further into humanity's face. Very soon, any home computer could do what Deep Blue did and beat any human alive without raising its circuitry a degree Celsius higher. So the gun sights were set now on the world's greatest exponents of the Chinese board game, Go. The complexities of Go, with its 19 by 19 board and identical black and white stones, are so unimaginably grotesquely huge that Moore's law or no Moore's law, brute force is still decades away from being a solution. Compared to Chess's Shannon number of 10 to the power of 120, Go has a game tree complexity of 10 to the power of 360. The observable universe has a mere 10 to the power of 80 atoms, you will recall, and most people would probably call the universe jolly big. <laughs> Go presented then a real test for real AI, and forward to take up the challenge came machine learning in the form of Demis Hassabis and his deep mind AI, latterly acquired by Google, of course. That the plan was to deliver on the promise of the artificial neural nets first posited by the fathers of AI, thinkers and visionaries like Marvin Minsky, Frank Rosenblatt, Ray Kurzweil, and others. In, in March 2016, way earlier than the date Hassabis and his team had dared suggest, DeepMind's AlphaGo program beat one of the game's top players, Lee Sidol, and then in May of this year, the world champion, KG, fell to AlphaGo, uh, which could now rightly crown itself world champion. For those of us following the course of AI, this really was a turning point. Unlike brute force, machine learning allows a computer to act for itself, more or less unsupervised, able to discover its own heuristic strategies and procedures. Given the smallest instructions and the most basic carrot and stick drive to reward itself for wins and mark itself down for losses, reinforcement learning proved itself capable of play that justified, in the view of Go masters, the descriptions beautiful, bold, surprising, creative, imaginative, intrepid, and artistic. Tesla's rule bids us say, yes, but, yes, but Go is a closed, abstract system. It has no reference to anything outside itself. It's isolated from the mess and noise of the world. Therefore, winning at Go requires no real intelligence. And AlphaGo no more understood Go than Deep Blue understood chess. Well, advocates for deep machine learning could point to IBM Watson's victory over the long-running TV quiz game Jeopardy. Um, there are still those who think someone from IBM was pulling on levers in the tradition of the Mechanical Turk or Professor Marvel in his tent operating the Wizard of Oz. But for the rest of us, this coup demonstrated not only a computer's expected ability to access, analyze, and reproduce facts at lightning speed, but also a commendable grasp of Jeopardy's perverse and idiosyncratic inverted question and answer format, not to mention the tortuous puns, homophones, rhymes, and other forms of high-level wordplay necessary to understand a question in the first place. Watson, who is a bundle of AIs, of course, not one master brain, was offline when playing the game, but had all of Wikipedia baked in, naturally, plus more than 200 million other pages of information. And this is where it all gets interesting, because the data that AI had to mine in order to play Go were really no more than mil the millions of games it had played with itself, whereas Jeopardy's AI needed to grind out, sift, winnow, and refine the world's knowledge, such of it that a TV producer might regard as general, at least. But even if Watson needed only 0.025% of the human knowledge in order to be competent at Jeopardy, IBM could fanfare Watson's victory as proof of how efficient a fuel data can be when it comes to powering AI. After all, like Deep Blue, Watson is first and foremost a promotional tool for IBM's sales department. Google Translate, which you must confess you have used, does not understand language at all. 
It doesn't even have the faintest grip on syntax, semantics, phonemes, or grammar, but has nonetheless dealt the traveler's phrasebook a nearly mortal blow, and we must constantly remind ourselves is not now, today, what it will be in six months, let alone in a decade. So put together brute force, deep machine learning, reinforcement learning, language recognition, universal data mining, and perhaps we can acknowledge that we are starting to get closer to something remarkable. Data, of course, is the gasoline that will fuel the engines of AI, and big data acquisition is increasing, as I have said, exponentially. Even if Moore's law has only a decade or so to go before it reaches physical limits of silicon's capacity, awaiting us are new materials, indium, gallium, arsenide. I had a look today at Sanjay's lab. Um, titanium trisulfide and graphene nanotubing, um, not to mention developments in qubit stabilization that are opening up the possibilities, or maybe I should say probabilities, of quantum computing. All this should convince us that the wall that came at Garry Kasparov, the wall that the exponential gradient so suddenly and devastatingly becomes, that that wall is almost upon us. Nothing can stop it. Nothing can stop the usual human nonsense that will result. The first uses will be war and sex, naturally. Armored exoskeletons, obliging cyber companions, unimaginable fantasy scenarios, augmented and virtual realities, blending with reality reality in such a way as to make a lot of money and cause a lot of ethical headaches. But above all, be prepared for the bullshit as AI is lazily and inaccurately claimed by every advertising agency and app developer. Companies will make nonsensical claims like, our unique and advanced proprietary AI system will monitor and enhance your sleep, or let our unique AI engine maximize the value of your stock holdings. Yesterday, they would have said our unique and advanced proprietary algorithms, and the day before that, they would have said our unique and advanced proprietary code. But let's face it, they're almost always talking about the most basic software routines. The letters A and I will become degraded and devalued by overuse in every field in which humans work. Coffee machines, light switches, Christmas trees will be marketed as AI proficient or <laughs> AI savvy or AI enabled. But despite this inevitable opportunistic nonsense, Reality will bite. As autonomous driving becomes the rule, not the exception, more blue and white collar jobs are taken over by AI systems. The art market will be fooled by AI paintings one day. Music wholly composed by AI will be found to have made the charts. AI devised scenarios will be made into movies. They're at least heralding a great rise in Hollywood's quality. Um, <laughs> All kinds of industrial, social, and governmental systems will go on the AI grid, and once jacked into the matrix, as with the electrical grid and the internet grid, they will never survive off it. Optimists, and I think I count myself as one, assert that repeated mechanical labor, precision calculation, and backbreaking repetitive toil are but recent temporary elements of our primitive phases in agriculture and industry. They're no more natural and inevitable a part of human life than pulling oars on slave ships or picking potatoes for a feudal lord or sending children up chimneys. They say we concede such work gratefully to the machines and take comfort in Moravec's paradox, which states that high-level reasoning, precision repetition and calculation so difficult for us is easy for machines, while simple motor skills that a five-year-old human can do without thinking, such as tying up shoelaces, skipping, dancing, or catching a ball, are astoundingly difficult for machines, enough to be considered impossible for quite long into the future. So we can dance, play cricket, or baseball if you must, um, <laughs> and skip into a bright tomorrow without tripping over our laces while the machines stay in school and do all our work for us. The pessimists point to bad actors, hackers, extortionists, terrorists, perverts, and thieves who will inevitably come close to holding the planet hostage by absorbing, hijacking, corrupting, and weaponizing AI systems. What Photoshop can do for the faking of still images can now be done for the moving image. Already, we can place a politician in a brothel and see them licking honey off a prostitute. It's their word against ours that the scene is genuine or confected. And this fact will, through endless false positives, allow politicians actually to go to brothels and lick as much honey as they like <laughs> of prostitutes, and they'll always be able to dismiss it as fake. 
I saw this headline in the New York Post just three days ago. Hackers could program sex robots to kill. <laughs> you can expect much more of this kind of clickbait hysteria. If we thought the Pandora's jar that ruined the utopian dream of the internet contained nasty creatures, just wait till AI has been overrun by the malicious, the greedy, the stupid, and the megalomaniacal. I haven't even begun to address the effects of CRISPR-style gene editing, bionic augmentation, the move to transhuman metabiological states of being. The first human to live to 200 is generally agreed probably already to have been born. Anyone in this room who's now half my age, and that's probably most of you, will almost certainly live twice as long as me, if you get my meaning. My nephews and godchildren will probably make it to 120, their children to 200 or beyond. No one really doubts this. We sleepwalked into the internet age, and we're now going to sleepwalk into the age of machine intelligence and biological enhancement. How can we make sense of so much futurology screaming in our ears? Well, since the cognitive revolution that gave us language 5,000 generations ago, humanity has been conducting a kind of quiet lab experiment on itself in which we've tried to understand who we are, how we work, how we got here, what, where we might be going. We call the lab experiment philosophy with its internal departments of logic, epistemology, the study and theory of grounds and knowledge, of knowledge, metaphysics, aesthetics, and ethics. The starting pay for smart graduates in the field of AI being recruited by big corporations is $500,000 a year. That's your entry-level salary. That may annoy some of you. Um, <laughs> the big corporations and government departments do not, unfortunately, employ philosophers at any salary. And perhaps this is the time to call for a change to that. Ethicists do have some presence in the corporate and medical world especially, but that's more as a hedge against litigation than an investment in understanding. Isn't it fascinating that we are trembling on the brink of creating machine intelligence at exactly the time that we are making and confirming discoveries about our own evolutionary acquired human intelligence that demonstrate to us as never before how contingent, fragile, unconscious, involuntary, and opaque our own natural minds and brains seem to be. Never has our sense of who we are and what makes us seemed less solid. Philosophy, neuroscience, psychology, cognitive studies, and evolutionary psychology have converged over recent decades in the search for a deeper understanding of ourselves. For example, Daniel Kahneman and uh, Amos Tversky's work on the biases that underlie our judgment and decision-making and the narrativized elements of our memories have shown us how radically and irrevocably unreliable our conscious and unconscious minds truly are. Raul Martinez and others have as definitively proved as could be wished that free will really is an illusion, or at best a paradigm. We can give vehicles autonomies that we don't appear to have, for it is clear that we are not in control of the automobile of ourselves. The self appears to be less a discrete entity than what Daniel Dennett calls a center of narrative gravity. Yuval Noah Harari's books, Sapiens and Homo Deus, confirm for general readers like me how our most cherished thoughts, beliefs, institutions, world pictures, and intellectual structures are myths. We can no longer trust that the old capital letter virtues, justice, virtue, truth, mercy, and so on, have any exogenous meaning or validity. Our sense of human exceptionalism has been dealt numerous body blows of this kind. The empathy and altruism on which we congrat congratulate ourselves turn out to be evolved stratagems that are no less likely to be found in amoebas and vampire bats who feed each other, nurse each other, and can be witnessed sacrificing themselves for the greater good of the survival of their families and species quite as impressively as we humans. The deontic inner voice, the divine conscience or Kantian moral law we long thought we detected within us seems to be no different to a congenital instinct or stratagem programmed into us by evolution just as Asimov's prime directives may soon have to be programmed into robots. But the ironies don't stop there. Just as we have worked out, thanks to Darwin and genetics, how we evolved into what we are without the aid of gods or intelligent designers, 
we are now in a position confidently to announce that by the end of this century, there will be cognitively skilled entities on the planet that actually are the result of intelligent design. We will be the intelligent designers, the gods, or at least the Prometheus who gives the divine spark to our creations. Daniel Dennett articulated this ontological Merbius strip by observing how a process with no intelligent designer can create intelligent designers who can then design things that permit us to understand how a process with no intelligent designer can create intelligent designers who can then design things. You can unwrap that when you get home. So if, like Prometheus, we're to be punished for this hubris, we can't say we haven't warned ourselves. Greek and other myths warned us, and when we were growing up, Ray Bradbury, George Orwell, Aldous Huxley, Isaac Asimov, Margaret Atwood, Ridley Scott, Anthony Burgess, H.G. Wells, Stanley Kubrick, Kazuo Ishiguro, Philip K. Dick, William Gibson, John Wyndham, James Cameron, the Wachowskis, have in their own ways articulately, eloquently, and repeatedly sounded the alarm. So we are being asked to wake up to the excitement and thrill of the creation of autonomous sentient beings at just the time we are realizing how little autonomy we, in fact, have and how little we truly understand consciousness and cognition at all. There's another irony, or maybe it isn't an irony, but a tragedy. All this is also happening at just the time when mankind seems most notably to be suffering one of its greatest ever droughts in authority, unity, and consensus. Never in our lifetimes have we had less faith, it seems, that there are any responsible adults in charge who can ensure that we get this right. There is no locus of authority, no center of gravity, intellectually, socially, or even morally. The compass needle is whizzing round, and there are no lodestones to pull to true moral north or true moral south. Christ on a bike, look at who our current leaders are and ask if there ever could be a more disastrous world in which to unleash such utterly transformative technology. If at the height of our culture wars, we cannot agree that social justice is a desideratum or on the nature of equality, gender and identity, for example, how can we possibly address such issues as cyber sex slaves, robot warriors, AI detectives, machine-enabled security, or automated judgment and punishment? The most cherished achievements of the Enlightenment and humanism could well be fatally wounded by statistical and epidemiological real-world and genetic data that fly in the face of our most cherished beliefs, let alone the manipulation of machines by hackers, extremists, and rival governments. So. Anyone can outline the dangers and the threats. What's the answer? I'm happy to be able to tell you the answer is... <laughs> no. <laughs> do we trust? Do we trust the uh, interested corporations? Alphabet, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, Microsoft. Do we have faith that governments will get there? Do we, as I and others have been pushing for, finally utilize the great resource of world philosophy and ask David Chalmers and Saul Kripke, Judith Butler, Daniel Dennett, Nick Bostrom, Peter Singer, and their like to guide us? You might say that everything's fine. We got this. Oxford University has the Future of Humanity Institute with philosophy's leading thinker in AI, Nick Bostrom, as well as indeed as Gary Kasparov on its research and teaching staff. Elon Musk has founded OpenAI and advises on Boston's Future of Life Institute with Max Tegmark and other heroes of what we might call the movement. Musk has also assisted Berkeley's MIRI, the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, founded by Elisa Yudkowsky. The machine, um, uh, my alma mater, Cambridge, has the Leverhulme Center for the Future of Intelligence, while Caltech, Stanford, MIT, Princeton, and this storied and magnificent institution at Murray Hill are all doing their bit as far as arming us for the future is concerned. But are they joined up enough with the rest of academia and the wider world? I remember when I was rector of Dundee University in Scotland for eight years, being astonished that the School of Computing there had such little contact with other departments. It didn't help with networking or scheduling or payrolling or statistical analysis or any notable forms of interdisciplinary research, which struck me as a terrible waste. If I were the principal or chancellor of a big university now, I would instantly commission urgent reports from the head of every single department on the coming impact of AI on their discipline and the likely effect 
on their graduates leaving for the world of work. I would insist too on everyone reading everyone else's report. I would be happy to close my university until I felt everyone was on board and we were ready. Because you know, we're living in a floodplain and a great storm is coming. Perhaps the most urgent need might seem counterintuitive. While the specialist bodies and institutions I've mentioned are necessary, we need surely to redouble our efforts to understand who we humans are before we can begin to grapple with the nature of what machines may or may not be. So the arts and humanities strike me as more important than ever. We need to understand our soul, spirit, sense of beauty, sense of humor, empathy, love, jealousy, rage, hate, boredom, surprise, enmity, faith, loyalty, art, dance, inspiration, intellect, and excitement. Because the more machines rise, the more time we will have to be human and fulfill and develop to their uttermost our true natures. One of the reasons I was so happy to be asked to deliver this Shannon Luminaries lecture is that people here, you, whose reputation was built on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, are so open to looking inward to the human heart. Bell Labs seems, as ever, to get it. While I've offered, of course, no answers that won't have been thought of by most of you here, I hope can at least add my voice to the public conversation such that decibel by decibel, the amplitude of our sound wave is raised enough to reach the ears of the institutions and organs of power. The decibel, of course, like this great institution, is named after Alexander Graham Bell. Unfortunately, it's a logarithmic unit, so to raise our noise by one will take quite a bit of loud shouting, especially when so many of those we are trying to address appear to be deaf. But then again, Alexander Graham Bell always wanted to be remembered not as the inventor of the telephone, but as a pioneer in his original field, as a teacher of the deaf. So let us all undertake to carry on his work now. Sound the bell. I thank you. Thank you very much. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank goodness. You win, you win the prize for the longest round of applause. Oh, goodness, that's very kind. Relief, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I just noticed I did that sound, sound cloud um, a few days ago and sent it to your good people. It, it, it was just, there's a website called soundcloud.org or something and you just upload your, your text to it and it makes the sound cloud. And it I was so pleased that Will was... Will was right yeah, in the middle. Yeah, right in the middle. <laughs> I must have used it a lot. I, I always used to make the terrible joke that um, while some people are always concerned about uh, whether we are the sum of our genes or of our upbringing, um, they, they always forget this issue of human will. I said it's not a question of just of nature and nurture, it's a question of nature, nurture, and Nietzsche. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, that, will that, is important. That was a, just a fantastic treatise. I'd obviously read yeah. the Hay Festival lecture, but you, you've taken that and amplified it more, which I didn't think was even possible. And oh. lovely references to science and Bell Labs, and, 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 but it all wove together in just a, a lovely, lovely narrative. Okay. So uh, the thing that occurs to me, we had Jan LeCun here, uh, obviously one of the uh, younger founders of AI, but mm. obviously uh, invented uh, uh, convolutional neural nets. And we talked to him, and he said the reason he works on neural networks is to understand how he thinks. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I wonder whether, in fact, uh, you, the coincidence you point out these things are happening at the same time yeah. is, in fact, uh, there's a group of people, Jan and the like, that actually want to build models AI models, machine learning models, in order to better understand who we think. And in doing so, maybe that's how we master the machine, because we end up understanding ourselves a little bit more. And so this dilemma you have of yeah. how can we possibly control the machine when we don't understand ourselves, perhaps the two are actually in, in, in linked. I, I, I agree with that completely. Um, and I, I said, you know, that I think one of the most urgent reasons for us to redouble our effort of understanding ourselves is because, of course, we will have more time to, yeah, to be ourselves. And, you know, obviously, I haven't addressed all the issues of universal basic incomes and all the other sort of economic and uh, political fallout that might happen from this. But also, it was so interesting to me to read a little about the history of Bell Labs. And, and you realize this 
you, history has these explosive moments, mm -hmm. these, these really quite a sort of a nuclear explosions almost. And um, it, it's funny, it's been in the news, obviously, for pretty grim reasons, but the American Civil War was one such. And, um, and one of the reasons, I remember my dear friend, the writer Gore Vidal always used to say to me, so Stephen, you have to realize there was nothing to do with slavery. Well, it was this to do with slavery. The rest of the world would not trade with America so long as America had a labor force that didn't need to be paid. It was an unfair uh -huh. business, and that's why the North wanted to get rid of slavery so it could trade with the rest of the world. Well, now, whether there's some kinds of complicated truths, but what's so fascinating is that within the shortest possible time after the Civil War, that's when this explosion happened. And um, you had, obviously, you had that, there was this, there's this theme that keeps resonating, which is the connection of America, the transcontinental re railway line. I love all these things that just keep repeating like a rhythm. Um, you know, the, the big four uh, from San Francisco, and they, they put the golden spike in uh, uh, as the two lines met and America was covered. And one of them was Leland Stanford, who gave all his money to form the university that bears his name, Stanford. And of course, when, Claude, uh, when um, William Shockley went to Palo Alto, there was Stanford University was just becoming big. And Stanford, of course, invented the mouse and then the, the whole thing sort of developed from that end. And at the same time, then, there was the telegraph the, and, and um, the uh, Western Union, um, as you probably know, Pony Express lasted four days after they completed the, the wire <laughs> to, to, between America as the, uh, it took 110 days to, for, uh, for the West to discover uh, the death of President Harding. Uh, 110 days. And then the next president was Lincoln's assassination and the world knew instantly because of the telegraph. And Ezra Cornell, who was president of, of Western Union, he gave his money to a university as well, Cornell. And, mm. and, and so the, you get this. And here in, in New Jersey, there's so much. Obviously, Menlo Park, where Edison was, and Princeton, of course, and the Institutes for Advanced Studies there, and, and, and the amazing influence of you know, Gödel and people like that on, on the information theory and mathematics generally. But then also Edison and Tesla and trying to, to get electricity across America and how do you do that in the whole ACDC business and, mm -hmm. and the business of having to rectify the current in the first place, which was necessary for telephones, obviously. So you had to, you had to do that. And, and then Alexander Graham Bell, how do you get the telephone wire across? Because unlike the, telegra the telegram wire, it takes a lot more. And so uh, there came these tubes and then I and I love the fact, and then Marconi, <laughs> Marconi did the same thing. Yeah. Marconi wanted to get, he did a transcontinental broadcast of radio. So you have all these technologies suddenly arriving, and then, of course, the motor car as well arrived. And, um, uh, all within the same, you know, the same decade and a bit, really. All these uh, technologies arrived that was to define the 20th century completely. And they, they all had these ambitions, and, of course, they were all made of materials that, you know, Edison could sit in his laboratory and, try different metals for a filament until you hit upon tungsten and then there, there was the light bulb. But, but 30 years after that, that was really impossible. And what you're doing with the, you know, gallium arsenide is not something that you could do in an open lab bench with bunts and burners. It's uh, no, it's, you need a bit of liquid helium and whoa, dry vacuum. Goodness knows what you but, but, So what I'm fascinated by is, because uh, obviously Ray Kurzweil has had this idea, the singularity where everything mm. sort of, the exponent goes upon the exponent and it's out of control. Yes. But in fact, in reality, your wall, which is very nicely depicted, often then plateaus. Plateaus, yeah. And so what With animals, of course, and populations, it does because they exceed the carrying capacity exactly. of a particular animal. But, and Do you think in humankind uh, it plateaus? Because we talked about this last night, which is in the end, we get to something that we perfect. And in that perfection stage, there are smaller increments. Yes. And so we sort of plateau. And then, then there's a, a, a delay before the next phase of disruption. And so we don't actually end up going like this. We end up going in phases that are more manageable. Do you think that that's it seems, true That seems to not? be the case. And yeah. I'm, you know, I, I, I think it's, um, there is a word for this, and I can't remember what it is. It's a word in logic, or it's named after a person, but that it's essentially when you sound a warning, by sounding it, it stops being true. But if you don't sound it, the thing you're warning about will happen. And you know what I mean? Yes. So you say, if we don't build traffic lights here, a child is going to die. They build the traffic lights. They say, well, there are no dead <laughs> children. What are you fussing <laughs> exactly. about? You know? and, uh, so well, that's your clarion bell. So in a sense, that is the bell. Yeah. And, and, and uh, it's a shame we can't fit a bell curve into this. Or even uh, the old bell logo. Yeah, or bell, exactly. <laughs> but uh, no, I, 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 I think you're right. Uh, um, and in a sense, we've had since the arrival of 
the iPhone, you know, the smartphone generally and that sort of... Um, and when... We've the, had a bit of a plateau. 2007, yeah. it was the, you know, Twitter was... Going, Facebook was really taking off, Twitter was arriving. And since then, things have eased out and, and they're going to get, I think, we all sense, big again, particularly when we say goodbye to, to, to the smartphone. Yes, so you're absolutely right. And then, of course, all those cloud-based systems that are going to analyze every, every piece yeah. of data coming from every physical thing and system and physiologically as, as you point out. Or there'll be a big one. There will be a, you know, a, a, just a terrible breakdown of, of things. I don't know how, you know, we all sort of fear, that, you know, there have been ransomware attacks that have been pretty disastrous, but may, maybe there will be a big one that will make us sort of pause and, and reorder things at a governmental level. I don't know. So, so the, the other part of uh, that I, I find really fascinating is you... you point out that aesthetics and cognition and art and beauty have to be part of this equation this time yes. around. Uh, why, why do you believe that so firmly? Is it, it's not just a convenience, or it's not just a nice thing to say by an artisan? Well, well I, I think it's two reasons. It's, it's one, because um, we can look at calculations and what machines can do in terms of calculation, and of course they can come very close to... Uh, As of the AlphaGo example. Yes, and it's a long time ago that uh, that experiment... Where did that take place? It's somewhere in Northern California where they played three pieces of music. One was by Bach, yes. another one was by a contemporary Baroque composer, and another one was by a, uh, um, a computer, and, and uh, the majority thought that the other Baroque com com composer was the computer, and, and, and many thought that Bach was the computer, and, and, and most thought that the computer was Bach. So, you know, you can fool people, and as I said, you know, there will be headlines, because we love scoffing the art market in which, you know, a computer-generated piece of art will, be, will fool somebody. Um, so we have to be very sure about what we... It would make us examine what we really value, what, what, what it is we value. And, and, and the Moravec um, you know, paradox is, or, or the, and the, uh, uh, is interesting because, you know, we will, own, we will start to value only things that are particular to us. Like, we don't value... I mean, chess is still wonderful between humans, but it doesn't... It doesn't hold get the its cachet, exactly. It doesn't. Yeah. And, and I guess Go doesn't either um, amongst Go players in the sense that, you know, they can see how amazingly a machine can do it. But certain things still will, and uh, comedy and uh, performance, uh, things that make you cry, things that tickle our things emotional... Things that cause us to emote. Yeah. yeah. And, and we've all, we all used to laugh. It was almost a cliche of science fiction that, uh, you know, Star Trek TNG data was always asking... Captain Picard, what it is to feel. I can't tell you, Data. I have to decide. <laughs> <laughs> Make it so. And and uh, <laughs> and then he'd be switched off, and he'd turn on yeah, his, his, his emotion chip, <laughs> and so on. But you know, they, as as with so much of uh, Star Trek, they, they were addressing something that is very fundamental. If you think for uh, just a little about a machine, and uh, assuming uh, 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 how would we make machines more? Uh, we either decide to make them absolutely machine-like so that they don't even begin to look like a human thing, rather like the, that went through the, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the GUI of, uh, of, of, at Apple. Mm -hmm. They suddenly thought, hang on, we don't want the address book to have fake little ring, rings in it, like in, making it look uh, like a Rolodex. Yeah. You know, what's, why are we pretending to look as if we belong to the real world? Um, and maybe we will demand of computers that they are cold, sterile, hard things. This is the, the idea of making this uncanny valley concept. If you, if you bring them too close to us, we reject them. So yeah. keep them in a realm where they're, they're separ separable but useful. Yeah, exactly. And, and we must, I'm sure, start to value things more like <laughs> our own smell. Uh, you know, <laughs> the, the real dirt and grainy nissness of us, the quiddity of us, the, the absolute nature of of our humanity will become something infinitely more prized. And my hope is that <laughs> that will bring us together. And of course, you know, there's always a... You know, the gritty, always dirty, grainy part of us is actually what... Uh, yeah, we will value. We will, will, value. We will see as a, uh, some of the things that we will explore. If machines are, uh, are busy doing... Uh, you know, in Japan, about six months ago, they fired 60 clerical workers at an insurance office uh, and replaced it with an AI system. So, you know, the white collar invasion has begun, which people always say as if it's more important than the blue collar, which is so extraordinarily rude and snobbish, but, you know, I don't know why they do that, but I suppose that's because newspaper people are white collars. So exactly, they so they report over the next um, they, 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 they feel threatened, <laughs> yes. Um, so once all that, you know, once all the things that are repetitive and boring and we don't need or want to do, after all, even you, scientists, you get the computers to do your big calculations. It's the first use computers were ever sure. put to, was to do your sums for you, so you didn't have to you know, get wrist cramp on the blackboard. That's how they all got to be yeah. here. They, exactly. You know, they... <laughs> we, exactly. We didn't want, you know, there's so many things we don't want to do. And if you actually make a list of all the things we hate doing, 
then give that to the machines. And that's what we've done over, over history, you know, vacuuming and, uh, and washing up and uh, so watching television so we can have a recorder to watch television for us and didn't have to do it. <laughs> The Douglas Adams observation. <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, generally speaking, machines do the stuff we don't want to do. And that, you know, the idea that we're having machines to, uh, to do things that give us real pleasure uh, and contact and, and tickle, you know, we are... We've got this higher level function that is this yeah. delight function we talked about. The hedonic principle the hedonic. is so important. But we don't yeah. get to spend as much time there because we're consumed because by the mundane. Yeah, we're, yeah. We're exactly. And, and as uh, Harari and many other writers have shown us, really, it's one of those things that's so obvious, you rub your eyes and think, well, why didn't I think of that? There is nothing natural and inevitable about work. <laughs> it's just nonsense to think that it is. Obviously, there are, we like to, to mine the riches of the earth or, uh, on the surface of the earth to harvest the bounty of nature and uh, to feed ourselves, and we do so on a, now on a massive scale. An excessive so scale. That, yeah, yeah, that takes work, but a lot of that work we don't need to do. We don't need, really, we've got agricultural machines and so on, because... As Harari claims, you know, the agricultural revolution was a mistake. Was a big mistake. <laughs> it enslaved people. Yeah, yeah. Suddenly, we were in fee to our liege lords, and and we had to work. At, he calculates, I forget what it is, but he, he basically said hunter gatherers can be said to work in terms of actually hunting and actually gathering, perhaps three hours of every day, and not necessarily every day at all. The rest, they're walking, moving, making camp. You know, they don't obviously have villages and settlements, and, and they are so healthy, and they seem, you know, a lot more cheerful, uh, the, the few that are left on the, the, the On the cave paintings, they had smiley faces. Yeah, exactly. So, so. Uh, whereas the peasants just constantly laboring yeah. in the field to bring up food that doesn't even belong to them because of the, <laughs> the, the, you know, the unpleasant kings and so on. So, and then the Industrial Revolution magnified that to, to a terrible And it's degree. been a series of mistakes ever since. You uh, could argue in terms of our work, and that may be, and it's a blip in human history that of we've course. had that. And so we can just say, well, actually, those days are over. We don't have to. And if we decide that we don't have to work, and if Moore's Law and the developments and things you're doing and with robotics and, uh, and, and, and uh, everything else really do coalesce in the way that we're thinking they might, um, then there can be a very exciting and extraordinary time for human beings. But, you know, I would suggest that the poetry and understanding and so on are a large part of it. Otherwise, we will go around again like a, one of those Star Trek planets that's apparently living in a golden age where you have oh. boys and girls <laughs> and blonde <laughs> curls skipping around and, uh, and actually all a bit being a bit empty-headed, you know? So, so it's a lovely idea. Well, I like the Star Trek thing because I think, um, if you think about where Star Trek predicted the future would be, we go off exploring again. And one thing that Harari says is, when, uh, the, you know, when, when expansion occurs generally in human existence, mm. It's, it's on the premise that we don't understand everything and we go, go off and find yes. new knowledge. And so the Star Trek was new frontiers in space. Whether it's space or not, I guess your cognitive aesthetic thing is, and scientific, will go off and discover new things with the extra time we've yeah. created. And that will create the next phase of existence. Absolutely. I mean, that, that would be. And, and another thing Star Trek got, got, got fantastically right. Um, obviously venting tachyon beams, a big, big one. Uh, <laughs> but um, it was, um, uh, Nietzsche, whom I mentioned, or Nietzsche, as he's called in America, um, uh, he, uh, he wrote that book about the, the birth of tragedy, and he, he, he mentioned how Greek tragedy and Greek art and so on expressed so perfectly the two elements of humanity, the Apollonian, he called them, and the Dionysian, i.e. Dionysus, the god of feast and revelry and fury and foam and fierceness and, 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 and excess and, and appetite and lust. Um, and the Apollonian, which was harmony and beauty and rhetoric and speech and logic and understanding. And he understood, uh, Nietzsche's point was the Greeks had come from a tribal bloodlust feuding uh, existence of, you know, from Ionia and across and they'd settled and they had somehow, we still don't understand how, become this remarkable civilization, but they still contained that Dionysian side, that as, and on top of it, they laid the beauty of, of their harmony and their logic and their understanding and their scientific view. And that the tragedies play out the tension between these two. We can never get rid of them. And Star Trek does exactly the, the same. same. The thing. original Star Trek has on the one side someone who is all Apollonian logic uh, in the form of Spock. Spock yeah. And in the form of, um, of McCoy, they have someone who's all, you know, damn you, <laughs> Spock, you green-blooded monster. <laughs> and, and, and in the middle, you have the man who is constantly trying to be the perfect human who is a mix 
of both. Yeah. He has the emotional side and, and chides Spock for not having it, but he also uh, chides Bones for being too kind of... Too and, and not only that, but they go to planets where there's usually a mistake. One of the planets is either savage <laughs> and needs a touch of logic and order, or it's all logic and order. That's it right. needs some humanity. Yeah. And, and it needs some... Yeah, and, and, of course, this, these are the things we now sort of examine because we look at a machine. Now, we're not going to gender machines, I assume. And maybe there will be a, a, a big push to, to, to gender machines in one form or another. And you'll have cisgendered machines and you'll have fluid gender machines. I, I don't know if that's a very good idea, <laughs> aside from the <laughs> sexual robotic side of sure. it, which is a whole other area. Sure. But, that's um, a different trade. But if you don't gender them, nor do you... I mean, if you, if you burn into them anything approaching a, um, a moral sense... That's very difficult because we're not agreed on a moral sense. Mm -hmm. You know, we can agree on language. If I say bottle, we more or less understand, all of you, what I mean by bottle. But if I say freedom, every one of us will have a different sense of it. Trump has a completely different sense of freedom <laughs> to the one that I understand. Um, and, you know, uh, it's true of a lot of very important words that, that mean so much to us. Justice, right, virtue. Um, these are not things we can agree upon. And we, so who is to program... Uh, any kind of, uh, and if it merely goes into, if, if it dives into the data lake and learns to swim, which is essentially what machine learning is, is just diving in and learning to swim, it may become, it may pick up some very unpleasant sewage uh, from the data lake. It, <laughs> it almost certainly will. It will, uh, as, yeah. as have some chatbots have demonstrated. Absolutely. That, that they replicate the sewage. Yes, precisely. Be because it propagates. Exactly does. It grows yeah. things. Exactly. So I, I could go on forever, but it's actually your turn. Uh, so uh, the audience gets to ask one question. No, no, we'll do a couple of questions. <laughs> and then a few of you have the golden ticket back to your uh, Willy Wonka Are they reference. the ones with the shirts? The, they, where are the golden tickets? They oh, they're they, down here because oh, they get to come and say hi to you afterwards. Oh. Yeah, the, the rest we're going to dismiss and, and <laughs> corral somewhere. Uh, but uh, anyway, so questions. Oh, Steve. there's a lady there. Yes. Thank you, Stephen, for a very fascinating talk and discussion. Okay. Uh, we have watched your shows and all of the family, we are fans of uh, your shows. <laughs> you. um, so first of all, I mean, actually two questions come to my mind. One is um, the literary work by Asimov and his uh, iRobot and his laws of robotics. Yeah. So do you think that, as we have seen the technology advance in the past 60 years since Asimov wrote his books, that we need these kinds of laws to govern how uh, robots or machines should work and what mm -hmm. do you think of that? And second is on AI. So as a comedian and an actor, would you say that if a machine can wholeheartedly laugh at your jokes or your wit, that would be the epitome of AI. <laughs> that's a, that's <laughs> There's a new test. That's a good Turing it's test, isn't the, it? The fry, the fry test. <laughs> it's a wonderful thought. Well, well firstly, on the, on the Isaac Asimov and the, and the uh, law, three laws of robotics, which are first that a robot must not kill a human, ever. Second, that a robot must always obey a human, except yeah. where it... Uh, Violates the number first, one. Uh, yeah. And the yeah. third one is uh, it must look after itself. It must defend itself except, again, where one and two are, are, are broken. And that's a, it's brilliantly, I mean, distilled. What a great uh, constitutional lawyer Asimov would have made. Um, I think what's interesting, and, and I think they are very wise and sensible, and there's no question, especially when you look at the, the possibility of uh, warrior bots. Uh, um, you know, we're already living in a drone era that we would never have believed 20 years ago. It just would have been, again, science fiction. And as Arthur C. Clarke, said, you know, everything uh, um, that, uh, that you can't explain in technology is magic until you explain it. It, it, is, it has the function of magic and it appears to be magic. And, um, and science fiction has been a wonderful, you know, petri dish in which, which these various sort of mm -hmm. cultures and futures have been, have been uh, grown and we've examined them and they are, it's amazing how, how impressive they are. Well, one thing Asimov I don't think predicted was that there's quite a strong move. Um, so if any of you have children, what are you going to ask, you know, suppose you're you know, what are you going to suggest they, they study at, at university? And, 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 and how, how much will AI be, be across the, the various disciplines? And um, Law is, is obviously uh, going to be very interesting. First, there's a lot of legal work can be done by, by machine, uh, by intelligent machines. Um, uh, but also, there's been a great sort of move that there should be a constitution for robots, that robots' rights must be respected. It sounds it's absurd, but, <laughs> you know, that's, again, it's, it's a, it's, it's, we're wanting to imprint a, mm. a human sense of what is morally decent and right onto a robot, and we're, we're already sort of privileging it with a slight sense of... Uh, 
of life, you know, in the, you know, there have been many interesting, and Peter well, Singer... Well, anthropomorphizing, yes, like we always do. exactly. Pets, Peter Singer everything. has written very interestingly about whether, whether you know, whether a chimpanzee has human rights, um, and uh, because it is a human. It's just not a homo sapiens. Yeah. Um, but it is, you know, it's in, in a sense, it's a primate. It's, you know, the word human is... Just, yeah, so anyway, the l lawyers look into that. So that's sort of very much one side of it. And the, so... It's the new Turing test. It, yeah, the new I Turing test. Comedy is, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, comedy really is one of those things. Um, horror films, pornography, and comedy, and I suppose a very sad romance, are capable of causing, causing us to make noises and physical responses that actually change our bodies, our body temperatures, just by being exposed to them. A good joke, you can't have it. You go, ha, like that. You actually make a noise, similarly with a fright. Ha! Like that, you make a noise. Um, and that's a very extraordinary reflex, and it's deeply human, and you can't have time to stop and think about it. It is absolutely, it, it just happens, you know? Um, and, uh, and I suppose that is probably as good a test as you could ever have. You know, the, 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 you remember Liza, or the, 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 the sort of early therapies that, therapist that you would have, a sort of intelligent therapist on computers. I mean, it's going all the way back to 1979. You could get it on an ordinary, sort of very early computer. And you just say, I'm not feeling very well. I'm sorry to hear you're not feeling well. It was, oh, quite, it was, theater, it was yeah. quite convincing. Yeah. It wouldn't pass a Turing test, but, but it certainly couldn't laugh at you. Um, uh, you could actually trap it by saying, I've got this joke. Um, why is a chair? And it would go, ha ha, that is very good. <laughs> <laughs> I've got your number. <laughs> so so it, I like that idea of vestigial things, things in the cerebellum maybe that are so guttural and instinctive. Yeah. Those are the real tests, yes. I think. Deep and, and limbic things. Deep limbic things that yeah. you can't, and, and yeah. I, I think the, uh, the other one I'm always reminded of about, uh, someone pointed out recently about VR experiences. Uh, the reason why you vomit yeah. Uh, when uh, it's out of sync or the latency isn't correct, is because uh, it, there's, there's only one human uh, disorientation that's historic, and that's poison. Ah. So if you think about it, the only thing that we would have protected for 20,000 years ago yes. uh, that would have disoriented us would have been magic mushrooms, poison. So therefore you so must you, you vomit, and so that's the one thing that we still have that is vertigo disorientation. We have a vomit reflex. It seems inappropriate, but it actually does its job. It stops you from doing yeah. the thing, that, and so we've never replaced it. But it's to your point that that set of things is the thing that will test yes. whether, whether you're human or not. It is, it is the encoded interesting, things. It? Yeah. yeah. I, I, I mean, of course, the the, um, the interesting thing is um, uh, what it will do to. I mean, religions, of course, have, have had a, over, over some period of our history have had primacy in telling us, you know, much about our, our destiny and our, where we come from and who made us and so on. And um, what will, how they will respond to this coming wave, because I suspect they're probably not that prepared for not, it. Not so happy, probably. No, I don't think they will be happy about it. But uh, again, I mean, the, the history of religion uh, over the years has been that um, it's, a bit, it's a bit like uh, that's not AI, the Tesla um, a, a law about yeah. uh, the moment a machine can do it, it's not, it's not AI. And religion has said God did everything, and then we showed, well, he didn't actually he didn't do that. that but that's okay, <laughs> he did everything else, or it, well, not that bit. And we've, you know, science has taken bigger and bigger nibbles yeah. uh, out and li left religion very little. But, you know, I'm, although I'm not a believer, I I'm, I'm, you know, don't want to waste my time being rude and unkind to people who are devout and of pious faith who don't mess with the rest of the world and get on with their lives. That's absolutely fine. But, but it will be an interesting challenge for them. It I absolutely suspect. will be. And, and it, uh, people like interesting... Um, Harari, for example, is essentially functionally a, a non-religious Buddhist. Uh, and there's that chap who just wrote that book, Why Buddhism is True. I don't know if you've seen that big yellow book that came out recently. And, and so there's a sort of move towards, rather like in the 70s... Contemplative and, stuff. Yes, um, exactly, taking the, taking the best bits of, uh, of Buddhist philosophy, Eastern philosophy, if you like, but w without it necessarily making it a theocentric uh, kind of uh, uh, study. It's, I think you're right. I think that's probably where we end up, which is not a, not a bad thing. No, 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 no. Another question. Okay, <laughs> there you go. Oh, there we are. Oh, right behind you, Bobby. Yep. Oh, Run. <laughs> yeah, the other behind. Yeah. There you are. Uh, Stephen, thank you very much. Be wonderful, wonderful speech. Oh, I'm you. so glad that I got a chance to hear you. Thank you. Uh, what you bring up as a question for me is what you were mentioning about Harari, who talked about that our move to from hunter-gatherers to 
people who farm and so forth, that that gave us some progress that allowed us to think. You could, James Berg talked about it in his book, where that movement, the Egyptians and culture and civilization, even though we became slaves to the field, it then allowed art and other things to be happening in science and technology, and humans advanced as a result. And if we're on this next stage, where it looks like we're gonna have another breakthrough in leisure, yeah. where we're not gonna need to work as much and we're gonna give this to machines, how do you see it doing something to allow us to actually provide economically for all the humans on the planet? Food, shelter, the things we've been very unsuccessful lately mm. as, we, as our population grows. I don't envision capitalism accomplishing it. And I don't know where we go from there. If any, hopefully my question is crystallizing what I'm asking you. No, I if understand. If there's some thoughts yeah. you have, how this technological change, because I was also reading some of Marcus's book about our future X10 thing, where if we produce these massive changes and we don't need to work, if I don't need to work, how am I going to eat? Yeah. Okay, great. A yeah, good, good sycophancy on reading Marcus's book as yeah, well. Yeah, was, I thought it was well yeah. done, didn't but, um, it? And there no. was no money changed hands either. <laughs> I, uh, no, you can. Um, <laughs> These are really important and interesting questions. The first, I suppose, you'd say is leisure. Leisure is as new a word as this idea of, 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 of mankind having to work all the time. It's, it, it, it would be a nonsensical word to a hunter-gatherer or people from earlier cultures because life and work and things were, they were sort of continuous. There was a continuum, if you like, of, of those, and you didn't distinguish between them. And that would be a good thing to go back to. Uh, so we wouldn't even think that you know, life is life. You don't... Uh, um, uh, there's a great film called Let the People Sing, which uh, uh, Alistair Sim is a, is a music conductor, and the, the, the nasty film com uh, the nasty company, the coal, coal company, closes down the, the town's uh, concert hall, and, uh, and the, the, the capitalist in his you know, wing collar says, what the people do in their spare time is their own affair. Um, and Alistair Sim says, gentlemen, 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 there's no such thing as time and spare time. There's only... And, that, and that, that is, you know, the idea of spare time is an insult to the human spirit. And if we can, the further we move away from that, mm. the best. But the point remains, the move to the, uh, the agricultural uh, revolution, you could see the whole uh, move is to, to cheapen calories. Uh, and, and we have cheapened calories amazingly. There's hard labor, but we fill ourselves. Look at my tummy, you know. I mean, this is uh, inconceivable to uh, um, you know, uh, someone at Kalahari Bushman, whatever, to have a belly like mine. And they, you know, they, use their, they get their calories and spend their calories you know, on that sort of balance that most, um, most people, most animals do, in, in fact. And that's how we as animals always used to. And we somehow decided we could store calories in the most incredible way. Um, uh, but by farming, as we know, and so on. And now we get to this point where machines are going to be doing so much, but there'll still be m billions of people. And what is it now? Seven, eight billion of the population of the planet is just getting up to nine or something, isn't it? Um, well, there's Bill Gates, uh, who obviously knows a lot the, uh, these days ab about the developed world as well as everything else. He's suggested, which is a very good idea, a, a tax on robotics and, and AI which sounds weird, but you're actually taxing them as if they were workers so that you know, the, the, the money that they make yeah. from the work they do, it doesn't all just go to the owner of the robot and the owner of the company's uh, p patents on the AI, but is spread to provide what is known as the UBI, which is rather nicely the Latin for where, ubi. Um, <laughs> it, it's, uh, it's the universal basic, basic income, income yeah. this idea that, yes, capitalism red in tooth and claw is probably a, never going to, work for the majority of the population here, but some sort of planned economy that is what used to be called a mixed economy, uh, uh, as it were, which is slightly planned, but not so socialistic as to make everybody's blood run cold in America. Uh, and and to <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, that, that, that seems to be the most sensible thing. And obviously, it takes a lot of heads being banged together. And this is the problem of living at a time when tribalism and nativism and it seems to be on the rise when it should be the reverse. We should be uniting to address this problem as we should be uniting to address climate change. These are things that need us to put aside the, the petty and absurd differences between us and, and, uh, and, and work on this. Um, so I don't know when a politician will rise with the guts to 
to say this and the strength to do it. But, you know, you need each country to have someone a bit like Justin Trudeau, who has a, a, a glimmer of understanding and uh, seems to be personable and smart enough at the moment. All politicians <laughs> disappoint in the end, of course. But that, that, there's another uh, fry rule we could have. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> well, he was just somebody wrote all politics ends in failure. Oh, that's true. Uh, yeah. But, By definition. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And, and, and um, so you, we, we do need that. And of course, we can get it. It just takes us to cry for it uh, loudly, and it needs those of us who are communicators uh, to 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 get it into the conversation more and more and more, so that this is looked at. And this is again why I want to go back to academia because I think, as I say, if every if the economics department of a university was looking into both, of course, you're looking into what you can promise your students when they graduate and to push them into the world of work. What what you can project will be there for them to do so you prepare them properly but you're also you're trying to um, to work as universities do and this laboratory does it is you're trying to to give the world information that is useful uh, uh, and technology and understanding that is useful and, and and economists have made pretty much disgrace themselves with their obsession with algorithms and and using them for to, you know making a fortune in markets and so on um, maybe it's time economists have, you know, went back a bit and they are going back to sort of slightly more Keynesian principles um, and, uh, and but it is as I say you, so you just need to get together the the heads of universities, which a friend of mine once said, what, what's the collective noun for heads of universities? It's a lack of principles. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to uh, ask a question related to that. So we, we're now in a world where the money has piled up in, a, in the pockets of a few. Yes. And that few have become deterministic of, of the successful move towards this future. You could argue there were monopolies in the past. There were, before that, probably gentlemen yeah. scientists. That is who another were rhythm that went to the railways, of course, and to Rockefeller. The exactly. Standard Oil was broken up. And now we're back uh, in one of those rhythms. Bar Bell managed to avoid uh, that, that uh, embarrassment of an antitrust. Uh, of course. Yeah. But, but you'll say, actually, some yeah. of them, and maybe your point is that the, some of the pioneering happens under those circumstances. Yes, it does. Because you've question. got those individuals who come together and are driven and have the assets to Absolutely. progress. So you're optimistic then at where the money current lies might be the fuel that gives us the next wave of innovation, but is it a moral compass that, that, that's needed in that? I, I, I mean, it is, obviously. I mean, the, the um, Google and Amazon and Facebook in particular are, are harvesting data at the most astounding rate, which is making them vast sums of money, but is also banking this data for making even more, more money, yeah, yeah, yeah. as data, as we know, is the gasoline of, 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 the, of the new, uh, this new mm. technology. And, and um, we're very fortunate, uh, a man I didn't have much respect for in the 1980s, uh, Bill Gates, because mm -hmm. I thought Windows was so clunky and ugly and unpleasant and was holding back the uh, with computing. But I, I think what he and you know, Warren Buffett, and that goes back to another mm -hmm. great titan, a, a vicious man who had a monopoly, uh, who with Pierpont Morgan created um, US Steel, and that was Andrew Carnegie, but who mm -hmm. then went back to Scotland and spent a year you know, tracing... Building a golf course. Building a golf course in Dumfries, <laughs> but also thinking, and he came back and said, anyone like me who dies with money is a failure. I, and he gave it, you know, he founded the Carnegie Libraries and Museums and the Carnegie Mellons and the, the, the Carnegie Hall and so on. And, and this became, a, a, you know, a, a, an interesting thing. And Warren Buffett then repeated it and told his friend Bill Gates, you know, you've got to do like me. You've got to give all your money away. There's no reason for you to have all this money. It's got to, it can change the world. And this is where, again, the opt that there is a, you know, like we had a few years ago, the new atheists, which I was sometimes b bundled in with. We now have the new optimists, Stephen Pinker and people like that, um, who, who are pointing out that we never has the world been, you know, never have more women been educated. You know, I'm not just more, but proportional to the population of the world. Things are getting better. The Malala influence has been enormous, mm. uh, you know, and, and many others. That, but the halo from her, obviously, is the one we think of. But also, you know, the thing, education and uh, health outcomes are getting better and better and better in the third world. It's Still, of course, uh, you need to keep your eye on the ball, but things are improving. And the example of Bill Gates and, the, um, and, and Warren Buffett, uh, I, I hope, will force other um, mm -hmm. uh, people of that nature to realize that this enormous amount of money they have can do really exciting things. And in the end, people like that, whether it's Peter Thiel or whatever, we may not approve of, uh, of these people in all their, you know, their political direction, but it's sort of irrelevant. The great thing is you can always guarantee they are vain. They want to see their name 
on a building and a university. They and want and in, in perpetuity, in so perpetuity. They'll, they'll do the larger Absolute investments here. Right. That's, that's an interesting yeah. one. Vanity yeah. drives uh, good behavior. Yep, it's absolutely. When, when you're wealthy enough. From Alphabet to Zuckerberg. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's very good too. I hope someone's writing these down. Uh, these are tweetable for sure. Okay, we'll do one more and then uh, the, the lucky golden ticket holders, the Oompa Loompas with the golden ticket. <laughs> yes. uh, but uh, get to come up and spend time and then we'll have to wrap up. So. Last one. It's coming up on stage Stephen, to attack me. Yeah. What, are, what are your thoughts about the war on science? And what is the best weapon we have to win it as a rational people? This is such a good question. Um, it, it, it is a, immensely dispiriting. Um, the, the number of times people have said to me, science doesn't know everything, as if that <laughs> as if that's a meaningful remark. <laughs> as if that means anything is therefore sayable. Well, science doesn't know everything. Oh, we see one in that it's case. Throw everything out. In that case, yes. In that case, the world, there are angels just over there. And, um, but uh, why, um, Stephen Jay Gould, uh, if you remember, he had this rather sort of, he was a slightly odd figure, he was a great paleontologist and wrote many interesting books on genetics and uh, evolution and things. And, and um, uh, but he had this idea he called NUMA, uh, non-overlapping magisteria, in which he suggested that science get on with scientific things and the, the, the non-overlapping things could get on with their things. But actually, there is nothing that doesn't overlap with science. Science is a, it's a, it's a human quest. It's not a special sandboxed, some sterilized, hedged off place where certain kinds of genetically disposed people go, though obviously there are, looking at you, kind of <laughs> a lot of <laughs> Professor Frinks in the room, and it's fair enough. But no, I mean, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's so beautiful and wonderful and extraordinary what science gives us. It's so, it's so incredible, um, the, the power and, uh, of observation and testing and and verification and the excited move forward. And, uh, you know, it's, every scientist repeats it time and time. Science is uh, an expression of the limits of what we don't know. It's, uh, not knowing things is, is what excites scientists. Isn't this brilliant? We don't know. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how this process works. We don't know why this works. We don't know what's going to happen when I put this in one end and what's going to come out the other. We, we, we have ideas and we have frameworks and, and obviously there is verifiable stuff. I mean, it's, um, you know, these lights are burning. They haven't stopped. Um, and, and there's a lot of science behind them. You know, you look at Faraday. And I, I, th I, think, I think partly for me, because of, you know, my love is telling stories, listening to stories, reading stories, reading novels, writing books, um, drama, and so on. And I think it is a very natural human way to understand ideas by being told them in a story. And I mm. think, I think um, I'd, I, you know, I personally, if I was a, if I was a, a billionaire, I would have a, a science channel which was not to, um, li like the ones we have, but which, which was, you know, which figured you know, the lives of these remarkable people and told the story of Faraday and, and you know, Maxwell and Thompson and all these, all these extraordinary people and Einstein and, you know, and how they did what they did. And, um, not, not in an uh, over-romantic way, but in a way that kind of uh, opened it up to everybody because it is, um, it's very, very difficult to, to understand why people resist science um, until you see that it's really very easy and that is because they don't understand it. They simply don't understand it. I don't understand a millionth of the things you all do every day. It's beyond, I've, if I looked at one of your whiteboards, I would just have a headache, you know. And you would be very kind, and you would say, oh, no, 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 it's quite simple, it's this. And, and then I would get lost very, very fast. But I, I can grasp some of the ideas, and I can see what grows out of it. And um, I suppose we have, uh, in Britain, we had Richard Dawkins was the mm -hmm. professor of uh, the, you know, the furtherance of the understanding of science at Oxford, and that was a very good move. Unfortunately, for, for, for many, it caused, uh, you know, some people to see science, therefore, through Richard's eyes, he's actually a decent, lovely, charming, funny man, but he is always portrayed as somehow shrill and, and, and mm -hmm. unkind and uh, without a soul or a spirit. The whole selfish genie thing. Yeah, yeah which know. is such a misrepresentation of him, but that's uh, unfortunately how things go. Um, Carl Sagan, um, uh, DeGrasse Tyson here, and the, you know, there are, and the Phil Nye, the, is it Phil Nye? Bill Nye, the science guy. They, they're all trying to beat the drum, and they're all trying to remind people of how beautiful science is, and, and how the, the scientific principle, the idea, 
is so magnificent and open to, to all. Um, I, I guess I, I can't give an answer as to how you attack it. There, there have been mistakes on the part of philosophy and logical positivism and scientism in the past has suggested that the world is known. But the great thing about science and mathematics is it's mm -hmm. constantly telling, telling you that nothing is solved. You know, there was a period towards the end of the 19th century when everyone thought mathematics was solved, didn't they? And then, you know, uh, Hilbert's uh, problems arrived and Bertrand Russell's paradox and suddenly, and Gödel and, uh, and incompleteness, and suddenly everything was exciting again because science doesn't like solving things and saying that's done, that's solved. It's actually more exciting when you can say, look, suddenly everything's up for grabs, everything's exciting again. And I guess... Um, I Part of the problem in that narrative, I think, is that you have to be confident enough to because your point about others will jump in and say, well, clearly science hasn't got the Yeah, answer. they'll fill the space. And yeah. so it that you've, if you create a space that is empty, mm. say we don't understand, others put their ideas in there. Indeed. And there's a sense that that causes more yes. difficulty in some ways, because now they've, nature abhors a vacuum of knowledge, in goes all yes. other perspectives. It's kind of amusing that given that science has shown over the last 100 years how empty the universe <laughs> is, right. how empty this table is. Right. The, the gaps between the atoms are just so immeasurably vast. Uh, well, not immeasurably, obviously. But, uh, quite quite measurably, but vast. <laughs> but uh, I love the idea that the, what we lack, and I think this gets back to the cognitive aesthetic, we need better storytellers about what science is. I think that's true. And then I think uh, the willingness for others to fill the... the mm the empty container will be less because the narrative over here is so interesting. Absolutely. Right? I think, I think and, and I think one just thing that I just realized when I was having this wonderful tour this morning is I realized that how wrong the phrase machine learning is because it's actually human learning. We're asking machines to learn the way children learn to speak languages. We're asking them to dive in at the deep end and just through exposure copy, to copy data. A, copy and a baby. Yeah, exactly. to, yeah, to the rules of Jeopardy or the rules yeah. of Go or, or the rules of any particular system to learn them and repeat them. And, and actually, it's also wonderful because there should be a reciprocity there. I think humans should start to learn like that even more than they do. So maybe the, the, maybe the future is that we teach humans to learn science in the way we teach machines to learn humanity and that actually we throw people in more excited. We, we change the way science is taught. Obviously, the fundamentals of mathematics are never going to go away. That's the language in which most science is expressed. But there is still so much. You're absolutely these. right, because of course your teacher machine, if you weren't teaching it the formulae, the formalism, by examples, and yeah. you'd say, here's the narrative, you need to tell me the answer, but that's exactly how you could teach a child, yeah. rather than focusing on the formulae. Exactly. Because in the end, the formulae we never use, right, on a daily basis, or a machine can compute for you, right. as long as you know the input and the output, Yes. and then a machine contains the formulae that that's map right. those two. We can experiment like that. Yes. I mean, I think that's a lovely way mm -hmm. to think about it. Uh, the symbiosis of man and machine inventing the future. <laughs> we have to say thank you to s that you have a little person. No, it's, uh, th there is a little person we have to give you. Oh. You have to take the little person home with a you. Cyber <laughs> a cyber doll. Wow. <laughs> it doesn't have uh, some of the <laughs> degrees of freedom uh, you might want, but uh, here it is. Huh? You, you get a statue. Oh, and my it, goodness. And it is Shannon-esque. That's, oh. There you go. Wow. It's quite Thank you. You've won Teddy. the World Cup. Oh, it's glorious. And you see Shannon Unicycle. Ah, yes. Information theory uh, goes around the, the, the loop. It's magnificent. Thank you so much. So, we shake your hand. Thanks Thank you for you, a Marcus. wonderful Thank time. Thank you, Thank you, everybody. Thank you all so much. Right. Bless you. Thank you. So you get to sit here. Oh, I sit here now, don't I? And yeah. uh, you're, you're, you're going to hold court. Of course. So uh, thanks, everyone. And by the way, no one's ever stayed oh. that long. Normally, the doors open and the floods oh. uh, people leave. But so, thank you all. And uh, Ellen, over to you. And then I'll see you back over the other side. You bet, Marcus. Thank thanks you so much. much.